Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this third in our series of programs designed to help us think through COVID-19. I'm delighted tonight that we will feature Arthur C. Brooks, who is professor of the practice in public leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School, where he is also the Arthur C. Patterson Faculty Fellow at the Business School. Before joining the Harvard faculty, Arthur Brooks, as many of you know, served for 10 years as president of the American Enterprise Institute based in Washington, DC. He's the author of 11 books, several of which are bestsellers. Love Your Enemies, published in 2019, The Conservative Heart, 2015, and The Road to Freedom, 2012. Arthur writes a regular column for The Atlantic called How to Build a Life. And he has recently launched a podcast called The Art of Happiness with Arthur Brooks. He started his career, interestingly enough, as a classical French hornist and along the way has acquired degrees in economics and public policy analysis. Arthur, we are delighted to have you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you and so very Phil much. Jackson, it's a delight to be with you. <laughs> Our own Phil Jackson um, is an Amherst College trustee and a graduate of the college in the class of 85. Phil Jackson is priest in charge and vicar of Trinity Church Wall Street in New York City, where he leads ministry programs that touch on every conceivable aspect of parish life including liturgies, music, educational programs, membership, and stewardship of Trinity Church Wall Street. Prior to being ordained, Phil had an earlier career as an attorney. In addition to a bachelor's degree in history from Amherst, he holds a JD in law from Yale Law School and a Master of Divinity from the Church Divinity School of the Pacific. We're delighted to have Phil here. We're delighted to have Phil on our board of trustees. Thank you both so much. We're looking forward to your conversation. Phil, take it away. Thank you, Biddy. Welcome, Arthur. Good to see you again. Nice to see you too, Phil. How are you? I'm good. I don't know if you can hear it, but uh, I'm here in our apartment in New York and it's seven o'clock and people are banging uh, pots and pans and celebrating our uh, our first responders and healthcare workers. You can, you can actually, I can see them right outside, people outside their windows clapping and, and celebrating. It's, uh, it's really That's fantastic. Beautiful. You know, it's I'm in Brookline, Massachusetts, and I can't hear that where I am, but I'm feeling the same sentiments. So I'm cheering for the frontline responders, and it just goes to show you when you're in a, a terrible situation, when you have when you have discomfort, when you have challenge, it's always an opportunity to celebrate the great, uh, the the great, uh, um, the courage, the valor of other people who are stepping up in a crisis. Now it's a perfect time to show what we're made of, right, Phil? Yes, it absolutely is. Let me ask you, Arthur. What's, what are you doing? How are you faring during the lockdown? And uh, uh, what are you up to? <laughs> well, like everybody else, I'm staying home. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, abiding by the rules, which is as we're supposed to do. Um, it's, it's interesting. I just finished teaching a class at the Harvard Business School called Leadership and Happiness. And one of the things I teach my MBA students is that if you want to be a, an entrepreneur in life, if you want to treat your life like a startup, which is, you know, this is the big opportunity is to treat your life like an enterprise. You have to look at what everybody else would say is, is it not just a challenge, but maybe even a tragedy and see it as an opportunity for personal growth. I, I teach this and I teach this and and now I got to live it. <laughs> you know, I have to, I have to, you know, to practice what I preach. And so I, you know, I have to say it's been tough, but it's been very beautiful at the same time. I'm finishing a book. I was very behind on a new book that I'm writing for Penguin. And I had an editor that was getting a little bit uh, stressed out and, and, and now I'm ahead in that. But, but more to the point, I'm, I'm reading more, I'm praying more, I'm spending more time with my family and I'm trying to make this challenge into really a moment of personal growth. What are you up to, Phil? Uh, pretty much the same. I, well, I feel like I've, I've been, my life has been dominated by Zoom meetings uh, of various <laughs> yeah. times. Um, reading a little bit more. Uh, I miss exercising. I mean, you know, we get out and walk and, and whatnot, but I miss sort of my exercise routine. Um, I'm staying in touch with family and friends uh, on the phone uh, as, as, much, as much as I can. 
and uh, we we just kind of hunkered down too. You know, it's uh, it's uh, we we are weak. We we our, our head of security today. We have a daily uh, security briefing. He announced to us today that this was the beginning of week eight, day fifty two, day fifty one. I think he told us today, and uh, it looks like we've got we've got a little bit more to go. I'd yeah. Say. Let, let, let me ask worth, you. I'm yeah. sorry. Go on. No, just well, I was going to say it's worth pointing out. Um, it's not permanent. You know, people are starting to talk as if this were a permanent way of life, and it isn't. I mean, this is this is going to end, and there's all kinds of reasons to be optimistic about about when and 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 what's going to happen when it does. So it's important for us to remember for ourselves and to and to remind all the people watching and listening that not to lose hope. Well, absolutely. Uh, let's uh, let, let's come back to that. But let me ask you because uh, the, this new column that you started in the Atlantic, I just love it. Uh, you're in, you you've done two. Uh, uh, two columns uh, thus far. I guess it's going to be bi-weekly. Yeah, every two weeks. Yep. You're kind of the uh, you're kind of uh, your thing of talking about happiness and and how to build a life. I wonder if you, you yeah. could tell us something about uh, about why happiness now. You know, it's uh, I had planned to do this column for for a long time. I'd been working with Jeff Goldberg, who's the who's the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, and Julie Beck, who's my uh, my editor. And we weren't anticipating launching this column during the coronavirus epidemic. But and we thought about putting it off, and we thought, huh, what better time? People are thinking about their lives. They're, they're thinking about their happiness, as a matter of fact. And, and, and it gave me, gave us an opportunity to say, look, while you're in the, in the, you know, the stillness of your apartment or your house, think about these big issues in your life. Think about the things that you actually want to improve. Would you like to come out of the coronavirus epidemic? with greater skills to be happier than you went in? I would. So, so we launched it and I have to say, it's gone really well. I mean, it's a lot of people have been reading it. A lot of people have been reaching out. You know, we've started a podcast also called The Art of Happiness that goes along with the column. And it's really fun. It's really gratifying. It's almost like, it's, it turns out to be almost the perfect time. How, uh, how is happiness, how do you see happiness as being an art? Well, you know, in, in truth, I talk about it like science. I'm a, I'm a social scientist by background. My PhD is in public policy analysis, but I've been working across the social sciences um, my entire career. And one of the things that I've found is that when you, when you use the science of happiness, you have to, to use each element that you've got almost like paints in a palette on the canvas of your life. So it's a little bit art, a little bit science, but I like the art part a little bit better. I mean, this is this whole idea that that, that Phil, that you're in my life is something that we're constructing, that we're responsible for making it beautiful. We can't leave it up to chance. And, and there's mm -hmm. all sorts of ways to think about it too. I mean, sloshing the paint on only goes so far. Sometimes you need to uh, chip away the jade to find the sculpture that's inside that, that, that boulder as well. So there are a lot of artistic metaphors that I use to actually find the happiest person that we can possibly find and therefore share that happiness with others to lift people up and bring them together. It's lovely. lovely. Let, me, let me ask you this, you uh, about the three equations. This is from the first week's column. The three yeah. equations for enriching our lives. I thought that was wonderful. Could you say something about that? Sure. So the first, the first column that I launched was called the three equations for a happier life. And it sounds really wonky, I know. But basically, it follows a lot of common sense. I mean, the first equation is, is that your happiness is made up of three things, your genes, your circumstances, and your habits. And one of the really shocking things that people don't know about human happiness is that <clears throat> about half of your happiness depends on your genes. Now, that's only half, but for a lot of people, that sounds like an awful lot. And the way that, that scientists, that psychologists have figured that out is through studies of identical twins that were separated at birth and adopted to separate families and then voluntarily have been reunited to, to do personality tests as adults. And it's uncanny how much of their, their using statistical methods, they can figure out how much of their, their, their uh, personalities are genetic. And, and sure enough, about 48% of happiness, depending on these, uh, depending on who does the analysis, is, is you know, is genetic. So, so Phil, you know, it, your mother really did make you unhappy. <laughs> Shoot. Quiet. I know, I'm, I'm kidding, man. <laughs> is she watching? <laughs> But the, the other parts, that still leaves half, you know, and, uh, and, and the, two, the two parts of the, of the other half are your circumstances and your habits. Now, everybody's obsessed with their circumstances. Like, if I only get that raise, if I can only get that person to marry me, then I'll finally be happy forever. And no, 
I mean, we have an uncanny ability to go back to our baseline happiness levels because that's a, that's a process that psychologists call homeostasis. It's the inability to stay above your zone because you wouldn't be able to live otherwise. You know, if, if somebody broke up with you and broke your heart and you stayed unhappy forever, which you think you're going to be in the first couple of weeks, you'd die because you wouldn't be able to actually participate in life. So you go back and very, very quickly. There's studies that show that lottery winners and, and paraplegics both go back to their old happiness levels after about six months, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is extraordinary when you think about it. Yeah. So, so that's the part to, that you think is going to matter a lot, but you should kind of disregard it because you're going to be fine. Or even if you're happy, it's not going to last. The part to pay attention to is habits. And the mm -hmm. habits basically part are, are sort of the accounts, the, the accounts in which you need to make deposits every day. And there are four habits in that, in that, that you need to pay attention to. And that's the, that's the second equation. Say something so, about you want to go on to that one? Yeah, yeah. actually, I, I, I really like your, your discussion of habits. Uh, yeah, please, please go on. Yeah, so the habits, and this is the part, now this is a really important, this is the part that we can control. It's somewhere between 15 and 40% of our happiness is under our direct control. But you got to pay attention to four things every day. And you can't be undiversified. It's like you have to put a the, the deposit in each one of these accounts. through your faith, your family, your friendship, and your work. Now, now it's worth a little bit of uh, explanation here. Faith does not mean my faith. I mean, I offer it up to everybody, Phil. I know you offer your faith up to everybody, too. I mean, you and I are both Christians, but, but that's not what the data say. The data say that any life philosophy that's transcendent of ourselves and focuses us on other people and serving others, that works, but we have to practice it every day. You know, spend time in prayer and meditation, actually make sure that you're in communion with others, etc., Family is pretty self-explanatory. You define family the way you want. Friendship as well. Friendship is one that's neglected, especially by men. Uh, a lot of people, we find that the, the loneliest people in America are 60-year-old men. Uh, you'll mm -hmm. love this, Phil, that the, the average 60-year-old man, 60% 60 of 60-year-old men say their best friend is their wives. 30% mm -hmm. of their wives say their best friend is their husband. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And so I told that to my wife. She's like, huh, no kidding. Um, and so it's very important that we maintain our friendship chops. And then the last is work. And I don't care what the work is because I've been studying work my whole career as an economist. And I'm telling you, I've looked at above and below average income. I've looked at college educated, non-college educated. That does not actually affect happiness. What affects happiness is two things. If you can earn your success and you're serving others, accomplishment and service are the two secrets to a happy job. So faith, family, friends, and satisfying work through service and earning your success. If you could put a deposit in each one of those four accounts, you're well on your way to living your happiest life. Wow, I think that's, uh, that is so true. Um, I, I could comment on, on all four of those. Um, I would say, just my observation as being a parish priest for 27 years, yeah. is uh, the one we least deposit in is our faith. And the one we over deposit in is our work. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And we focus on the wrong things in our work too. You know, yeah, when people on the wrong things. work as identity rather yeah. than work as, as a locus of meaning or, or service, which I want to come to. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, exactly right. And you know, and you, your own career is a perfect example of that. I mean, you were a, a high flying lawyer, a Yale law, the number one law school in the world and, and at 27, you gave it up to become a priest. Obviously, being a lawyer wasn't a cut in it. And, and that's really important for all of us to figure out. I mean, think about it now. I mean, your, your work is all about, you know, saving people, helping people, lifting people up. I mean, it's, it's sort of the epitome of exactly what should bring satisfaction from work, as opposed to what people usually do with their work, which is money, power, prestige, those are the things that St. Thomas Aquinas said are substitutes for the true happiness that we want. They're, they're counterfeits, as a matter of fact. So the key thing is that, that you should take what you're, you, know, you're, you think you want, which is money, power, pleasure, and fame, and substitute for that faith, family, friends, and work. So you got the bad for, the vicious for, and you got the virtuous for. And that's really yeah. the way to, I mean, if you can, that's a good way to actually start trying to conduct your substitutions in life. What, uh, what, what is it about service um, that all religious traditions, certainly ours does, uh, it's at the root and heart of, of our tradition, serving others. What is it about that that's so universal, uh, you think? 
Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Is this is one of the many areas in which theologians and psychologists agree. Uh, they agree that other focused, other serving behavior is really at the secret of happiness, is at the heart of, of happiness, but they don't e- exactly agree as to why. And so psychologists will talk about it with respect to, to simply thinking about something besides ourselves. To the extent that you can, we're, 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 we're wired to think about ourselves because frankly, we wouldn't survive if we didn't think about ourselves. Yeah. But the problem is that, that how do you put, how do you say, it? it's just boring. I mean, it's just so boring all the time. And you actually find that people who are, who are suffering a lot from different forms of clinical depression, that they'll often say the most, the worst part about it is the boredom of thinking about myself a lot. Um, and, and so, and this is why, you know, in Dante's Inferno, he talks about, you know, the, the devil at the bottom of of the mountain, you know, half frozen, a block of ice up to his up to his waist. You know, all our all our Amherst students, of course, they've read Dante's Inferno. He's the great college and and you know classical education. And and he's twisting around in agony, not even aware of what's going on around him. In other words, it's just a it's an agonizing, boring life of pride. You know, and that's really the big problem. And so, other focused behavior is just more interesting, and it allows us to have a, a more fulfilling life, according to psychologists. Now, now, on the other side, you know, theologians think about this in a slightly different way. Theologians have quite correctly figured out that, that love is the nuclear fuel of happiness. Remember, work is one, but work that lifts people up, faith, family, and friends, which are based on love. Now, what is love? According to St. Thomas Aquinas, once again, to love is to will the good of the other. There's nothing mm. sentimental about it. It's not a feeling. It's nothing squishy and soft. It's, it's super hard edged. It's work. To love is to will the good of the other. If that's love and love brings us happiness and it's other focused, that's why service really matters. According to theologians, it's the, it's a little bit of the beatific vision, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would you, uh, would you say there's a difference between happiness and joy? Yeah, that's a great question. That actually gets into this notion because once again, that's the difference between theologians and psychologists. Psychologists, they kind of, they're a little bit dismissive of joy. Joy is a fleeting thing. Now, the, the, basically the way that psychologists have defined happiness, there's, there's the emotion of positive affect, which you can actually get from pleasure. You can get it at the, you know, in, a, in a bottle. You can get it from you know, smoking dope. But that's not, that's just pleasure. It's extremely fleeting. It's not something you can base your life on. Then there's a psychological happiness, which is kind of taking accounts, all things considered, good and bad things happen. I'm a relatively happy person. And there's this kind of good life well lived. They kind of, uh, psychologists sort of dismiss joy as being in that first category of fleeting feelings. Theologians, no, no, no. Theologians (laughs) talk about joy as being the ultimate thing that we want. I mean, so Christian theologians will talk about and Muslims will talk about joy in the sense of being in heaven. <laughs> so it's that it's that you know euphoria that you finally get when that window opens up and you see something that's really good. The problem is it closes, right? right. Well, right. people of serious religious faith will say, "Well, guess what? If you do things right, that window stays open." <laughs> exactly. Um, that's the offer, let's, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> let, let, let's go to the um, back to uh, how to build a life. Let's look at the uh, the second uh, column. I want to ask you uh, uh, what what uh, you, you you describe the column as, as being about how to find what matters and how to hold on to it at any age, at any age to build a life that feels whole. Can you define for us what matters and what are the things that make us feel whole? Yeah, you know, it's one of the things that I, I talk an awful lot about with my class or, you know, in, in my writing is finding the why in life. You know, we, we are encouraged um, in modern society and for that matter, in any society to only think about the what of life. You know, when you go to a party, Phil, and, you know, people say, hey, Phil, hey, what do you do? You, they're right. saying, what do you do for a living? Basically, it's the what of your life. Nobody ever says, why do you do what you do? But, you know, we need an answer. I mean, I, you have one, I, you know, I used to, Biddy mentioned in the introduction that I used to be a French horn player and, and I did that all the way through until I was 31 years old, until I finally, I finished college at right about that age. Cause I had, it was sort of a wayward youth. And, uh, and when I, you know, it's the, the reason I left you music and actually ball. became a, you and your French yeah. horn had a wayward youth, right? You, you play. Yeah, that's right. Ball. You know, 
exactly. I was on the road. I was actually in the Barcelona Symphony, a lot of that. And when I was when I was playing in Barcelona, I remember reading a biography of Johann Sebastian Bach, who is my favorite composer. And he was asked why he wrote music. And it's an extraordinary question, right? I mean, why do you not, not what's your writing process or all the dumb stuff they would ask composers and artists today, but why, why do you do it? And his answer just, just blew my mind. It actually changed my life. He said that the aim and final end of all music is the refreshment of the soul and the glorification of God. And I thought to myself, can I say that? And, mm. and I actually went on a vision quest to actually find a way to be able to say that. Now, again, for all the people who are watching us who are not religious, don't be stymied by that. What Bach was saying is that the purpose of your work, the why of your work is to serve, to lift other people up. You must find a way to do that. And I thought, I'm not serving anybody playing in this orchestra. I'm not even serving myself. And I actually went to, to find a way that I could study what I was really interested in, quite frankly, was, was solutions on how to lift people out of poverty. And that's what I studied. That's what I, you know, my PhD work in that. And it was extraordinary. I have to say that, you know, I got good days and bad days, Phil, but, but my why is box why, the refreshment of the mm -hmm. soul of others and the glorification of God is, as I can see fit. And, and I can tell you, I, I, I don't sleep poorly because of my work when I really think I'm living up to that mission. And that's the point. That's purpose mm -hmm. and that's meaning. And I encourage everybody who's watching us to, to give some deep thought during this coronavirus lockdown. What's my why? Not what's my what? What's my deep why? And am I serving it? Am I fighting for it? Am I sharing it? And, uh, and if I'm not, what do I need to do to change? Let, let me ask you, how, what would you say to some of our, uh, our young people uh, at Amherst who uh, might be watching us today? Who have, uh, if you're, if you've got to Amherst College, you've done all the right things and moved up the, uh, moved up the food chain and and gotten good grades and activities and scores and sports and da 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 da. Would you say to a young person maybe who this evening is is thinking for the first time, what is my why? Was my yeah. why just to, my why just to do that? Yeah, it's very easy to to think that to believe that, that that when you finally meet your destination, that you will finally be happy. And one of the great consolations of getting older, Phil. I mean, you and I are almost exactly the same age, and um, and it's extraordinary. I mean, the the data show that people they tend to they kind of bottom out between their mid forties to their mid fifties, but from their mid fifties to their seventy to early seventies, that's that turns out to be the happiest period in most people's lives. And if they, if they play their cards right, they can continue getting happier all the way to the end. Why is that? And, and it's in no small part because you realize that, that it's the, the journey is the destination, that the key to the treasure is the treasure, that in actually creating the good and doing what you're doing, there's an intense amount of, or there can be an intense amount of intrinsic satisfaction. And, you know, that's something that you can get a head start on actually learning. There's, you know, when I'm on college campuses, which I am a lot, and I was supposed to be in person at Amherst College, but this fall, this spring, but we'll, we'll do it again. And we'll, we'll find out another way because it's we'll just a couple there. hours we'll away from. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's such a beautiful place. I've been there. I love it there. Uh, what a wonderful place to study. What a great college, too. But what, when I'm talking to students and, and they say, you know, what should I be focused on? There are two things that I really suggest that, that is worth focusing on during the student years. The first is the sacredness of, of sadness. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we do, I think we do wrong today mm -hmm. in talking to young people is that we pathologize all discomfort and sadness. You know, we say that if, you're, if you have a lot of, you know, what, what psychologists call negative affect, negative affect, bad, you know, bad emotions, negative emotions and positive emotions are, are processed in different hemispheres of the brain. And so you can be a very high positive emotion, a very high negative emotion person, as a matter of fact. But when you're experiencing high levels of negative emotion because of anxiety, because of, uh, because of sadness, because of events, because of you know, a, a bad turn in a class or in love or with your parents or whatever, there's a tendency to pathologize that, to say any of that is bad, but it's actually quite sacred in a lot of ways. No, we don't want it to get out of control and hurt us. But at the same time, it's very important to remember that, that it's not just inevitable. It's super necessary. We find that, that negative experiences tend to be the times of greatest growth, which is why I hope a lot of people watching us are going to come out of the coronavirus experience in three years from now say, 
I didn't want it to happen, but I learned so much. Mm. It's also important to recognize that, that, that bad feelings per se have an enormous amount of benefits. They, they can connect you to other people. They're, they tend to be correlated with high levels of creativity, lucid thinking that's quite accurate. You find that leaders who have a certain amount of sadness tend to be better and more accurate and better decision-making leaders. It's also quite worth pointing out that, that a lot of bad feelings that we feel from you know, fear and sadness and, and even anger they can keep us alive because they alert us to threats. And so that's the first thing is to, is to recognize that sadness is a part of life and to embrace it. Embrace your poet. <laughs> the second thing is, to, is, is, a, is another little equation that I talk about with a lot of young people. Everybody wants satisfaction in life. And satisfaction is a hard thing to get because we have this treadmill that we're on. It's that homeostasis I talked about a little bit earlier. But satisfaction basically is made up of haves and wants. And here's the relationship. Your haves are in the numerator of your satisfaction equation, and your wants are in the denominator. Haves divided by wants. Now, everybody thinks to be satisfied, get more stuff, get better grades, get into a better college, uh, uh, graduate and get a better job, make more money, et cetera, et cetera. That's managing the H. That's fine as far as it goes, but your W in the number denominator, if you don't pay attention to that, it's going to run out of control. It's going to sprawl like the suburbs of Atlanta. It is going to grow and grow. And if you're not paying attention, that thing is going to be so huge that your satisfaction is going to fall even as you make more money and have a better job and get better grades. And you're going to wonder, why is my life so unsatisfying? And so the key thing I talked about young people is make a strategy for managing your wants, for circumscribing your wants. And what I mean is write them down. What is all that stuff that I want? What are all the things that I want? What are the relationships that I want? What are the jobs? What is this, what are the prestige that I'm looking for? Write it down. And then talk about managing it so it doesn't sprawl, saying, that doesn't make sense. I'm getting rid of that. Throw it away. Empower yourself by managing your denominator and your satisfaction will grow. It's like magic, actually. This is, uh, mm. this is one of the great hacks to happiness. So those are the two things I tell young people. Well, it's, it's terrific. I, I, um, I tell you, as a, again, as a, as a parish priest, it sometimes feels like even though we, we know the absolute truth of what you just said, there's literally a whole giant behemoth of a machine out there convinced whose job it is to convince us all that our wants are in fact our needs. Yeah. Yeah. It's a conspiracy. I think, I think you're absolutely right on. You know, it's, it's amazing to, to convince us of this. And, and I thought about this for a while, but I thought, you know, what is the, if I listen to, Madison Avenue or just, you know, take my values from Netflix. <laughs> I'm going to be convinced that the formula for a happy life is use people and love things and worship myself. That seems mm -hmm. like the formula for the happiest possible life. That's what, that's what, you know, everybody's telling me to do. But the truth right. is that all, all the verbs and nouns are wrong in that. I mean, it's amazing when you think about it. Every religious tradition, every philosophical, every secular ethical tradition tells us that, that, what, that the real formula is use things and love people. And if you're religious, love God. That's it. Worship God. That's it. You know, you should never, ever use anything but things and only within moderation. And you should never love any things. You should only ever love people. People are made for love. And the love is the will of the other. And so if we basically remember, use things and love people as opposed to vice versa, we're really off on, 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 to, sort of on to the right trail, I think. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, I see that, uh, I, I see that, that sort of uh, flip-flop made uh, every day, uh, every, yeah. every day, and, and how hard it is uh, to break away from, from that mindset. Um, let me, let me ask you this. You, uh, you talk about in the in the April twenty third column. Uh, actually, I, I, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna break. I, I want to go back to something you said about the sacredness yeah. and sadness, um, because that that is such a rich and and beautiful point. I, and I know our listeners may or watchers may not think that that in in sadness there is there can be uh, the sacred. But I think of the, uh, the the comment of one of my mentors, uh, Father Richard Rohr, the uh, Franciscan writer, who uh, who told me once. He said, "Phil, uh, I never learned anything important after the age of 35 by anything by any success I had." He said, "It all came from failures. It all came from 
from sadnesses. It all came the, the real the real learning, the real uh, depth of learning. And, and he also talks about how uh, in what he calls the second half of our life, uh, that, that the, the aim is to learn to then give self away. Uh, to your point, that, that we, we learn to give ourselves away and that the goal of that, the end of that, from from a psychological standpoint, a, sac- uh, a secular standpoint, is this funny thing called wisdom. Mm. That, that by giving ourselves away, we can actually acquire wisdom. Uh, what yeah. do you think about wisdom? Let me ask you. I, you so I, I appreciate that. And I've read Richard Rohr's work, and I, I recommend that everybody read it. It's, it's, it's excellent. It's wise. It's very moving. And, uh, and, and I'll address that because you've already addressed it from a theological standpoint more eloquently than I could. So I'll talk about it as a social scientist. Um, there are two kinds of intelligence, um, as defined by a, a famous British social psychologist named Raymond Cattell in the early 1970s. He talks about fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Now, fluid intelligence is what you've got just to the max when you're in your 20s and early 30s. I mean, this stuff is just coursing through your, it's your ability to analyze, to, 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 to multitask, to, to get jobs done, to learn the answers to new problems, to come up with solutions very quickly. That's fluid intelligence. Young people have it in a big way. It's one of the reasons that coming up with new solutions to old problems is generally speaking what's going on with people in the 20s and 30s. It's also the reason that physicists and chemists, generally speaking, do their Nobel Prize winning work. Um, mm. after they're usually by around the age of 32, 33, as a matter of fact, it used to be in the twenties, quantum mechanics was actually developed by, by, uh, Paul Desick, who's a, 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 a physicist in the early 20th century who invented the whole idea when he's 26, won the Nobel prize at 30, said that a, a physicist is better off dead before he's reached his 30th year as a result, but that's all fluid intelligence. Here's the good news. That's only one kind of intelligence. There's another intelligence curve that starts increasing through your 30s and 40s and 50s and can stay high through your 60s and 70s and either even your 80s, which is your, 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 your crystallized intelligence. And that's your ability to synthesize ideas and bring them into new ways of thinking. And, and it's extraordinary when you get into your 50s, when you, particularly when you teach. So, so you're a teacher. I mean, you're a priest, but, but you're a teacher. I mean, you're helping people understand the messages that come from Holy Scripture and, and synthesizing different ideas and bringing them to the pulpit. And I'm, I'm sure, as sure as I'm sitting here, even though we've never talked about this, that you're a better preacher at 56 than you were at 36 because oh, yeah. you have more <laughs> crystallized intelligence. And, and that's another way of saying wisdom. Wisdom is bringing ideas together. That's the reason that people need to think about their careers in a very integrated way. All the young people watching us today, you're going to make you're going to make your bones in your career with your fluid intelligence. But by the time you're in your 30s and 40s, you got to start thinking about ways that you can pass on your ideas. You can share what you know, that you can synthesize things, that you can teach, that you can be a mentor. And and crafting a full life is one in which you invent earlier and you instruct later. That's actually what Richard Rohr is talking about because instruction, um, teaching is at the essence of giving of yourself, giving what you know, helping people to be better on the basis of what you can share. Yeah, I, uh, I love the. By the way, your your column on uh, on on just that on aging and <laughs> yeah. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> really, at least at my age, it really it really hit me uh, it really hit me and touched me deeply. Thanks. Let's so Thanks. let's stay with the uh, the American educational system for just a second. Yeah. Uh, we know that as we were talking earlier that, that the uh, obviously this year is still uh, this coming academic year or the next one is kind of up in the air uh, as to what yeah. that will look like. Um, school closer, uh, schools closing, classes moving online, students and families unsure uh, whether schools will reopen. Right. Um, but you know. We don't just learn academic things in, as part of the, uh, the, of the experience. We learn how to socialize with one another. We learn uh, interaction. We learn, uh, hopefully, broadening of our minds. We might say in a way that, that what part of what happens at, at a place like Amherst over your four years, I, you should be maturing. Do you right. think that... What we're going through now with uh, uh, with the pandemic and with uh, having to go online, do you see any effects uh, that might uh, uh, that might touch that area of growth and learning? 
Yeah, uh, I, I do. And obviously I can see the costs, but I'm also seeing some benefits too. Now to begin with, um, maybe some people are watching us thinking about, should I defer? Should I, do, should I wait a semester? And the answer is no. Why? Because next fall is probably going to start weird and end well. That's what the data say. That's what most likely uh, a, a semester where you're half online and half in person or something, that'll be an ancient memory. And there's a lot that we can actually learn from that because we're getting better and better alternative teaching methods and students will be part of the experiment in doing that. So I'm recommending to people that they, that they, they, they not defer, they take an opportunity for actually learning in a new way. It's completely temporary, but to the, to the, you know, the, 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 the gist of your question is a little bit different. Are we sacrificing the socialization that is an important part of higher education? Answer is obviously yes. I mean, when you went to college, I think you went to college in 1981 at, at Amherst and, and you grew up. I mean, 18 to 22, these are formative yeah, years. Yeah, you made after years. a fashion. After a fashion. <laughs> I know you're still working on it. We all are. I know. <laughs> the dirty secret of being in your mid 50s is you realize that you're never really grown up. But, but I mean, you, you socialize, you, and you grow up because you're exposed to difficult things. Um, you're exposed to risky ideas, different ways of thinking, things that maybe threaten your old paradigms. That's, that's part of growing up that comes from socialization, learning together, as a matter of fact. Now, here's a problem in higher ed today that's actually different than in the early 1980s when you went to college successfully and I went to college unsuccessfully and almost immediately dropped out. Um, you know, the, the difference is that we've actually taken a lot of the socialization experiences that lead to a lot of benefit out of higher ed. And I know a lot of us are really quite worried about that. I mean, you find, for example, that the in loco parentis experience is sort of making sure that a lot of people are, are exposed to less risky ideas. It's extraordinary to me the extent to which, you know, on college campuses, people are protected from hearing things they disagree with. Well, that's a big problem because that's actually cutting down on the resiliency of our students and we're not serving them very well. So I, I wonder to the extent to which we've been actually living up to our socialization function to begin with. Um, either way, um, I come back to my first point, which is this is a highly temporary situation and we need to look for the best that we can get out of it, recognizing that by the spring of 2021, things are going to be normal and we're mm. going to go on with our lives. Okay, we, we heard it here. Thank you, sir. I <laughs> love, love, love hearing that. Um, let, me, let me, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to uh, open up a, um, a more personal uh, dialogue, if we can. Um, we, we, we talked a little bit earlier about how in, the, it, how in the spiritual master's tradition, certainly in the, in the, uh, the Christian tradition, I know in the Buddhist tradition, in the Islamic tradition, uh, that there's always been this group called mystics, the mystics. And the mystics bring us to um, a description of what they call uh, sort of uh, experiences with the divine. Mm -hmm. And in those experiences with the divine, they, they almost uniformly, universally describe the, those experiences as being what they call unitive, or that is that they, they somehow, when they, when they encounter the divine, they, they walk away with a sense that all things are one, or all things are in unity, all things are, are, of, uh, are of the same creator. Um, I was thinking, as I mentioned earlier, about, about uh, Thomas Merton's fourth and walnut experience, and I know you've described an experience you had with, uh, uh, with uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. When you were young, when you were 15, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, when I was 15 years old, I had the opportunity to visit the Shrine of Guadalupe in Mexico City. And, and I was not Catholic. I was raised in a Christian home. I was raised in a Protestant Christian home. And I didn't know any Catholics, but I remember sitting, contemplating the Tilma of Juan Diego in, uh, in, 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 in Guadalupe. And... And I remember it's, an, it's, a, it's a rather extraordinary thing, by the way, the, the image of the Virgin Mary in the Tilma of Juan Diego. It, this is at a time in the, the 17th century, or sorry, the 16th century, when the Spaniards were brutally suppressing the indigenous peoples, trying to convert them to Catholicism with complete lack of success. 
And well, what happened? The, 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 this appearance of our, b- believed still today by most Catholics, that the appearance, the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe to an indigenous peasant, Juan Diego, she appeared as a woman of mixed race. Now, sounds normal to us today. That is super radical at the time. The idea of somebody of mixed race. And what that did was, and, and it was imprinted on his tilma, which he, and, you know, and again, some people believe in it, some people don't. But in point of fact, this image of a woman of mixed race saying, you are my beloved son had this incredible catalytic impact on people. I mean, there were 9 million conversions in the, in the next decade. Uh, that's how radical unity works. That's when we come together as people and we can believe something bigger than ourselves. When we recognize the, what the Buddhists call the emptiness, the illusion that we are somehow separate. I mean, I realize that, that Phil, you and I are different beings, but, but in point of fact, I don't fully exist without the existence of Phil. I mean, that, that's what that is really saying, whether it's the Buddhist tradition or the Catholic tradition. And that had such a big impact on me. I didn't know how big an impact it had on me until many years later. I mean, I converted to Catholicism when I was 16 because of that, which is not nothing. But now I look back on it and I recognize that the true moral and mystical importance of that was happening without me knowing. And this is an important thing for all of us to recognize that, that the mystical moments, the hinge moments in our, in our, our spiritual lives they, they might be happening right now, and we don't know until later. Most mystical experiences are only recognized as such retrospectively. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. why we have to be so careful about the sacred. That's why we have to remember that every moment of our lives is potentially the moment of our mystical transformation. This might mm-hmm. be the epiphany right now. There might be somebody watching us right now and then who thinks about it, and she thinks about it. And in a few weeks, she says something's changed for me because retrospectively it turns out, I mean, probably not, (laughs) but that's a really important thing to keep in mind. All of my most mystical experiences in my life have, 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 they've shown themselves to me. They've revealed themselves to me after the fact. That's how mysticism works. It's an incredible gift. It it, it really is. You you made me think when you said it, you said it so beautifully, but I I was thinking of, um, uh, one of our professors uh, at Amherst College uh, was a guy named Bob Thurman, uh, taught uh, Buddhist uh, studies uh, back in the, uh, this, I guess, the, the 80s, 70s, 80s, and, and maybe into the 90s, he ended up going to Columbia. But I took a class on Buddhism with him, and he had us read this text, uh, a Mahayana text that he had translated himself. And uh, it, it, the high point of the text was when uh, the the Bodhisattva, who is the, the 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 sort of central figure of this text, uh, was able through silence to uh, declare that that the nature of non-duality was in fact the answer to the question what is non-duality was silence. And yeah. I, I you know I was I was nineteen or twenty when I read that and had no idea what that meant. And it wasn't until about six years ago, after being a priest for <laughs> over twenty years. That one day out of the blue, that came, that moment came back to me, and I understood what that concept meant. <laughs> it came back years yeah. later. And I was, I was able to understand the mystical truth at the heart of the obliteration of not <laughs> of duality. <laughs> oh yeah. No, that that the doctrine of emptiness and the non-duality, the illusion of individuality is something that takes many, many years to, and it's, I had a very similar experience as a matter of fact. I remember when I was 20 years old reading Zen and the Art of Archery by Eugene Harrigal, which is a great book and everybody should read it. It's uh, mm-hmm. and not to be mistaken with Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is a kind of a pseudo Buddhist book and I don't recommend it. Yeah. But Zen and the Art of Archery is really a very profound book. And it, it introduces this concept, this sort of mystical question of what is the sound of one hand clapping? And I thought, you know, I, I contemplated it. And, and of course, nothing came to me for decades. <laughs> and then when I was m- many, many years later, when I was studying in Dharamsala in the Himalayan foothills with the Tibetan Buddhists, I was learning to meditate with the Tibetan Buddhist monks. And, and I was studying this concept of the, the, the illusion of individual, of the individual. In other words, we all have common roots and we were, were simply different manifestations of the same common roots. And I realized that the question, what is the sound of one hand clapping, is not a question, it's an answer. So what is, who is Arthur, me, in the absence of Phil? And the answer is, 
It's the sound mm -hmm. of one hand clapping. It doesn't exist. <laughs> and it took me three decades to figure that one out, right? But, but it's important because those are the, the mystical questions that if we actually can, can focus on them, can contemplate them, they can actually help to help us. They can help us understand our deep why, our deep purpose, our deep meaning. And that's really a nutritious thing to do. That's worth contemplating during our coronavirus lockdown. <laughs> exactly. Um, we're, we're getting, I'm getting uh, uh, messages that I've got to stop asking you questions, although I feel like I could ask you questions for, for hours. Uh, but yeah, I know. Ask, we're just getting started. I, I'm looking yeah, forward no, to our, 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 our lunch together in New York coming up. <laughs> um, let, let me just quickly ask you before I go to these. I'm gonna I'm gonna pick some, but I'm gonna ask you. We talked earlier uh, this afternoon about uh, you, you made the uh, Camino uh, de Santiago. Could you could you say what yeah. that experience was like for you? Yeah. So the Camino de Santiago is an ancient pilgrimage. It's a one thousand year old Catholic pilgrimage that starts uh, and walks across the north of Spain. So it's somewhere depending on how much of it you do between 160 and 800 kilometers. Um, it's on foot, it's hot, it's blisters, it's staying in not very nice hostels, it's terrible. And it's the most beautiful thing ever. And uh, so pilgrims have been walking the Camino de Santiago to help understand the nature of, of their belief for these last thousand years um, to the Cathedral of Santiago, which is the site of the remains of St. James uh, the Greater, who was the the brother of St. John, one of the apostles of Jesus, who, who the believers, I mean, the uh, Spanish believers in particular believe that he was, that his remains showed up in Santiago, he's buried there. Um, it's, and it's an incredible experience. Now, pilgrimages are nothing new. The Hindus have been doing pilgrimages for 6,000 years. The Catholics and the, and, you know, the Christians have been doing it only for the last 2,000 for the obvious reasons. But pilgrimage is a very important thing because one of the things that we need to understand is that one of the barriers to our spiritual development is, is that we think of it as a task. We think of our religiosity, our faith, our getting in touch with ourselves spiritually. It's just, it's a bunch of work and who's got the time? I mean, reading ancient texts, sitting in meditation, praying, you know, being in communion with other believers, what a hassle, right? And the truth of the matter is that only when you can cross the, the concept from, 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 from task to opportunity, from, from, you know, a responsibility to adventure, can you actually understand the deep import of this for our lives? And a pilgrimage brings this to life. So everything is a metaphor, you know, it's just, you know, there's a pebble in your shoe. Well, that's your next problem at work. You've got a blister. Somebody broke up with you. I mean, everything, and one foot in front of the other because you're getting to Santiago and, it, and Santiago is a certain point of your life that's not more important than any other and yet is the place you're going to go. And just understanding yourself. I, I'm telling you, Phil, I'm never going to be the same. Um, mm -hmm. I recommend it to everybody that you, that, we, that you think about pilgrimage because you'll understand your life that much better. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, uh, well, sorry, I'm about to start, start talking with you. Let me, I know, let me, I want let me more. Let's go more. Let's keep going, man. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you about the, the pilgrimage that I took. I took with some uh, kids from my parish in Detroit. We made the pilgrimage to um, uh, Crow Patrick, uh, which is uh, the holy mountain of St. Patrick in, in the west part mm. of Ireland. And sure. uh, it was it was quite an experience. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later. Let me ask you this question. I like this one. How could new graduates prioritize building happiness when planning for their future? So it's imperative that they do exactly that. And one of the ways that we do that is by remembering some of the basics that we talked about before. So remember that the, the, the challenge and the opportunity in life is not money, power, pleasure, and prestige. It's not. It's faith, family, friends, and work where you can serve others and lift other people up. Now, the first thing that people are thinking about, the graduates are thinking about when they're going out in the labor market is what's the best job for me, right? I mean, those are the lucky ones, by the way. I mean, I teach graduates, I teach MBA students at the Harvard Business School, and they're all working like crazy. So they have, there's no problem with that, but and it's a tough labor market. So I'm sympathetic to that. But in the best of times is what's the best job for me? And the answer is that which in which you can serve others and which you can earn your success, where you can sense your own accomplishment. Now, thank God we live more or less in a time and place where people can make a living. 
you know, where we have opportunities, where we have options, where we have labor markets, where we can make that. So, but even when we don't, it's, it's the opportunity of our lifetime to be, to, to surround ourselves with, with work, with worthy endeavor that we can sanctify, that we can offer up because we're serving other people and because there is a sense of actually doing something meaningful, doing something that creates value. And I don't care if you're folding laundry, you're taking care of children, you're volunteering, you're working for an investment bank or you're a professor at Amherst College. It's really all the same. Earn success in serving others. That's the most important criterion to be thinking about. And the sooner that we get that straight in our heads, the sooner that we can do that, the sooner that we can be um, able to manage our own happiness and manage an ecosystem of happiness that we can bring to other people, which is really a beautiful and sacred thing to do. Uh, could you, is, is there nothing sadder than the thought of, of going through a life uh, with the, at the end of which we can discern no meaning? Yeah. And a lot of people do this. I mean, a lot of people find this. You know, one of the things I'm writing about, you referred to a, a, an article I wrote in The Atlantic last summer about professional decline. And, and I'm actually writing it up into a book right now that'll be coming out next year. Is it a book? <laughs> I'm talking to wait. I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it'll be out with Penguin. And I, I'm just learning so much. I mean, I worked on it all day today and I'm learning so much. I'm talking to people who the biggest problem with the midlife crisis that people have with their work is that they, they, they're really good. They're really accomplished, but they don't have purpose. They don't have meaning. And the only source of meaning is not going to come ever, ever from the money or the power or the, or the prestige or the fame that actually comes from it. Those are false idols. You know, and it's interesting. There's a party, there's a party game, you know, that when, when we talk about this, and again, this comes from the ancient Dominicans, who talk about the substitutes for joy and the substitutes for God, money, power, pleasure, honor, which means mm -hmm. prestige and fame. And I'll ask people, you know, what's your idol and, and put them in order. So money, power, pleasure, fame, easy to remember. What's the one that you're least attracted to, right? What's the one that doesn't attract you at all? For me, it's power, right? You know, I was president of a think tank in DC for 11 years. It was a chore to have power over, over other people. And I hate it when people have power over me. So it's easy for me to pat myself on the back, you know, hey, I'm super virtuous. I don't care about power, but let's move up the line a little bit, huh? right? And it turns out that, that all of us can recognize this idol that we fall, that we're in thrall of. And it's, it's an interesting, it's a dangerous thing. Don't fall prey to the idols. Remember that your true bliss is going to come from the four virtuous goals, faith, family, friendship, and work. In other words, love different manifestations of love. Work mm -hmm. is love. Family is love. Friendship is this platonic love that's at the heart of really what brings meaning and faith is love of God and God's love for us. Or if you're a secularist, even if you're an atheist, it's love for all of your surroundings so that you can bring more good to others. It's a, such a beautiful thing to remember that. But again, you know, I'm, you know, I'm no saint. I've fallen prey to the idols many, many times. I'm just struggling, struggling like everybody else to get my priorities in order. What, uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm, I keep being tempted to ask you my questions. Um, let's see, how about this question? Um, uh, someone writes, the effects of COVID-19 are so overwhelmingly negative for so many. Yeah. How can they find happiness in the midst of it? So one of the greatest uh well, there, there are basically three complaints for people who are not um, in, in, in harm's way. In other words, they're unlikely to suffer grave danger from the disease, death, or lose their jobs. And, and thankfully, most people are not in the situation of, of, of dying or, or, or you know, being permanently unemployed or even temporarily unemployed. Many people will, and this is a different situation. But I'm talking about most people who are suffering despite that. The reason they're suffering is because three, basically three things disappointment, um, uncertainty, and loneliness. So on, uh, disappointment is basically, and again, you know, we probably have some seniors at, at, you know, at Amherst who are watching us. And my son is a senior in college. My oldest son is a senior in college. He's graduating from Princeton. And you know, he's home like everybody else. He's doing his precepts and his lectures online. He's writing his senior thesis and he's super disappointed. I mean, he, he won't admit it because he thinks, you know, graduation, who cares? That's just a piece of paper. He's super disappointed. 
And, and everybody's disappointed. Look, I'm disappointed. I, I travel. I do, I do 175 speeches a year. I live to get on stage and talk to people and meet people. I'm like at the 99th percentile of extroversion. Everybody, <laughs> I'm looking at a camera right now, but I'm thinking of you and I love you. Right? I mean, this is like, it's pathological practically. So I'm really disappointed at the stuff that I'm not doing. People are missing, they missed Easter, Passover. They, they you know, their weddings. The problem is that they're thinking about it in the wrong way because disappointment is not the same thing as regret. Regret is something that we'll ruminate on so that we can learn from it and behave differently. Disappointment is a very similar cognition, but it doesn't involve your agency. There's nobody watching me here who's responsible for the COVID-19 epidemic unless you were patient zero. And even then you didn't do it on purpose. So, so ruminating on what you're missing, all it does is reinforces disappointment. So I recommend that people start today with an empowering reminder. I am disappointed, it is true, but I didn't do anything. So therefore I should not face regret. And as a result of this, I choose to move forward. Uncertainty is the same kind of thing. We have a tendency to, to mistake the uncertainty of, around this. We don't know what's going to happen with risk, something we can manage. How do we try to treat it like risk? We binge on news. You know, we watch three or four hours a day of CNN or look at the Johns Hopkins coronavirus, you know, website, but that's a mistake because you can't do it. And the same thing with loneliness, we can manage loneliness by understanding the social psychological basis of it, by understanding that we need more contact with the people that are touchable and more eye contact by using Zoom and getting off of social media, but a little knowledge goes a long way. Wow. Wow. That's good stuff. Good stuff. Um, how about this one? What trends do you see in the changes of college students want lists during this pandemic? I or noticed the college student. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, and because I'm doing my office hours on Zoom every day. <laughs> okay. And so and it's as I've learned to use it, we've all learned to use Zoom. And, and so, you know, I'll, I'll set up my, I'll be sitting here at my desk and, and I'll have a queue and every 20 minutes I say goodbye to a student and I let another student in from the waiting room. And, and actually it's, it's, it's good as far as it goes, but I'm hearing a lot of the same lament. And, and, and that really is a lot about, about seeing people and, and they, they didn't quite, they're sorry they didn't appreciate the value of cohort enough. The, they don't appreciate, you know, what it, what it meant to be in, in community quite enough. And now it's gone. You know, they've said, you know, my graduating MBA students, they're leaving. I mean, they're, they're going to go off to their jobs. They're not going to see most of their class again until they come back for their reunions. And they're really, really sad about that. And they're also suffering because, you know, they're in quarantine, some of them alone, most of them are not alone. But and so I, I wind up giving a lot of the same advice. And it's something we just touched on a minute ago. There's a... <laughs> not to be too technical about it, but there's a neurotransmitter that functions as a hormone called oxytocin produced by the human brain. And you get it in response to touch and with eye contact. And when you don't get it, you, you physically suffer, you feel lousy. And so people will say, I wake up and my back hurts. And I, I, you know, I, I don't feel rested. And the reason is because you're not getting enough oxytocin. So one mm -hmm. of the things that I'm telling students, and I'm telling everybody is that you actually need a 22 second hug therapeutically every two hours to maximize your oxytocin levels. So if somebody's touchable in your environment, go touch. Now I got a 17 year old daughter here. She's like, get away from me. But, <laughs> but my wife fortunately is not shunning me. Um, and so this is what it's like to live with a social scientist. We got a hug now. The other thing is to get more eye contact. And that means using this technology. I, I, I talked a minute ago about social media. Social media is social junk food. To get the oxytocin that we want is like empty calories because you don't get very much with social media, no eye contact and no touch. So people will binge on social media because their brains hurt and they wind up feeling actually lonelier. So everybody watching us, you should, you should limit your social media consumption to a total of 30 minutes a day and then therapeutically use Skype, FaceTime and Zoom and other eye-based technologies for one to two hours a day. And in doing that, and with your 20 second hugs, 22 second hugs on the two hour intervals, uh, you're going to start feeling a lot better. Wow. Wow. That's good stuff. Let me, uh, okay. I think uh, we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, let me ask this one. Uh, the qualities you mentioned aren't evident in our national leaders. Do you think they are making a bad situation worse? So, 
it's a good question. I contemplate this a lot. And I, I moved from Washington, D.C. last summer. I kind of got out of Dodge. And I'm liking it, i got to tell you. The problem is that we tend to get leaders that reflect us. I don't want it to be true. You know, I look, I'm a professor of public leadership at Harvard. I want leaders to be so visionary and so inflecting and so entrepreneurial that they bring society along with them for the better. But that's not the way it works generally. You know, just like in market economies, companies give us what we want more or less. And sometimes it's bad. You know, private markets give us poison gas and pornography, stuff that shouldn't exist. Why? Because it's profitable. Why do we have leaders that are antisocial, dysfunctional, that, that, that reflect our worst characteristics? It's because we reward it. You know, and, and, and again, we're in, an, in a moment of polarization, I understand. We're in a, a unique time, you know, really tough time. But, but it's in our hands. You know, our, my last book is called Love Your Enemies. Why? Because I'm completely convinced that we can reinflect our culture. How? By, by reaching out to people who disagree with us, who challenge us who maybe even offend us and, and treating them with love. It's interesting, you know, it's, um, and when I say love, I'm, I'm remembering is to will the good of the other. It's nothing sentimental about that. Dr. King in 1957, he said, you know, in Matthew 541, you know, Jesus said, love your enemies. He didn't say like your enemies because <laughs> like is a sentimental something. It's a hard thing, but to love them, that's what actually will create the market signals, can create a new social movement. During this coronavirus epidemic lockdown, by the way, we can change society by demanding something better, by looking within ourselves, by coming out of it better than we went in. And, you know, will it be overnight? Will it be magic like that? No. But I'm actually kind of convinced that I'm hopeful, at least, that, that good times are going to come. We're not going to be talking so much about leaders who bring out our, our worst angels forever. Arthur, last question. I'm going to stay with, uh, with that book. Could you uh, could you tell the story that you tell about the uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, gentleman and the gentleman from the uh, I forget who the who the group was, but uh, the the uh, they're on the National Mall and uh, I think it was maybe a Second Amendment group or, or something. Could you you remember yeah. that story? I, I thought it was really yeah, I do. Cool. Yeah, it was in September of September of 2016. Um, no, September of 2017. It was a, it was a Trump rally. It was a, called the mother of all Trump rallies with a whole bunch of very pro conservative and Trump groups, bikers for Trump, gun owners for Trump, et cetera. And, uh, and a Black Lives Matter group showed up. Black Lives Matter of Greater New York, as a matter of fact, which is run by a guy named Hawk Newsom, a guy who's become a great friend of mine um, since then. And, you know, he comes with his group and this is going to be trouble. I mean, he's got his fist raised in the air and, and you know, the black and, and the, 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 the bikers for Trump. I mean, you, this is combustible. So, you know, the people who were there did what you always do when you want to make things, you know, better. You take out your cameras and start filming so you can put it on the Internet. I mean, it's just, you know, it's the worst of society. But so there's a million films of this. But what happened was not what anybody expected. So what happened was the guy who was running the rally saw Hawk Newsome. He's hard to miss. He's six foot five. He's a huge guy. And he's decked out in Black Lives Matter gear. And, and you know, he, the, the guy running it, he sees him up on stage, says, why don't you come up here and tell the crowd what you're all about? This is America. And I'm going to give you two minutes of our platform and see if you can make your case. Now, Hawk Newsom, this guy is a really super serious Christian. And he says to himself, it's in God's hands. Lord Jesus Christ, give me the words, put them in my mouth. <laughs> and he walks up on stage and within two minutes, he went from them booing to them cheering, bikers for Trump, cheering for the head of Black Lives Matter of Greater New York. How did he do it? He did it by saying, I love this country. I want what's better for this country. I'm an American. I'm a Christian. He made unity with this group that he didn't agree with. I mean, nobody came away from this thing saying, oh, boy, he really convinced me. And, you know, nobody and, and, and Hawk Newsom didn't say, boy, those bikers for Trump, they have a, they're, they're making a lot of sense. No, no, no but they understood that they were brothers and sisters because of the unity that came from the things that from their shared, their common loves. He also made the case. He explained the black lives matter movement in a way where people were actually listening and not booing. And you know, what's my point? I mean, you can say he did it wrong. You can say he's wrong. You say the bikers or Trump is wrong. The point is this, my friends is possible. Loving your enemies is not a theoretical construct. It's not, 
pie in the sky. It's not ridiculous. People laugh at it generation after generation, but look, it changed the world 2000 years ago and it can change your life and my life today. You just got to do it. You got to be a little radical. You got to be like Hawk Newsome. You, you know, go where you're not invited, say the things that people don't expect and do it with warm heartedness, answer contempt with love. And maybe magic is going to happen. It did that day. Um, I think it can happen again. And I think we should all be down with that. We should be trying to make that kind of our goal. Arthur, this has been a true joy for me. Uh, I, I cannot thank you enough. I hope I will get to see you at some point, maybe in New York City or or up in the UK. <laughs> but uh, we'll make a I point just, of it, Phil. We'll. They're going to let us out. They're going to let us out sooner than later. And you and I are going to break bread, and uh, and and we're going to be friends for a long time. And I appreciate it. Oh well, thank you for being with us. I want to hand it back over to uh, Madame uh, Biddy. Uh, would you take it from here? <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Thank you both so much. What a wonderful conversation to listen in on. And uh, thank you so much for being here, Arthur. We really appreciate it. I, thank you. Um, thank you, Betty. Phil, thank you. Um, what a wonderful interlocutor you are. Um, we have a, a, a final event for now on Thursday at five o'clock. I'll be asking questions of Zeke Emanuel, Amherst Class 79, an oncologist and bioethicist who is also a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and vice provost for global initiatives at University of Pennsylvania. So please join us and uh, everyone stay well. <laughs>